They're probably the, the number one catastrophe of our youth is they have no one to talk to. That's the number one catastrophe of our youth. Your child goes to school, let's say they go to public school, that's the majority of Muslims, they, they put their children in public school because they can't afford Islamic school or whatever reason, right? We don't blame them for it, that's their circumstance. So they put their children in public school. By fifth or sixth grade, their, your children learn some pretty filthy vocabulary in this country. I don't care what state you're from, right? There's some pretty dirty vocabulary. They learn how to access some pretty disgusting websites. They learn how to download some pretty hideous things on their PSPs and iPod videos or, or iPod touches or, or iPhones or whatever. So they're pretty advanced but at a very early age. Things you would never have learned until you're 25, they know when they're 12. That's the reality. That's what's going on today. So, how many parents here know what Facebook is? You guys know what Facebook is? Show of hands, please. Okay, Twitter. You know what Twitter is? It's not when your eye bugs out. It's something else. Okay, so, so your kids are on these social networking sites where they have, they, they're, where, where predators, literally predators, have access to talk to your teenage daughter or to your son and to, to engage in relationships with them over, over the internet and eventually they meet up with them and things happen. This is a reality of the Muslim youth today. This is happening. This, we shouldn't close our eyes to it, we need to open our eyes to it. And you say to yourself, nah, not my kids. Nah, not, not my, no, please, wake up. Don't, and some basic solutions, before we talk about the bigger picture and what we need to do at the masajid, some basic solutions, do not have open access internet at home, especially when you have children under the age of 12. Do not. That is a horrible idea. Do not give your children a laptop. Do not give them a machine, a phone, that has anything but phone numbers. No texting. Don't, don't give them text message phones. Don't give them internet access phones. You are asking for trouble. You are asking for trouble. You will regret what you did later on. You think you got them these things because you love them? You are destroying them. You are destroying them. They are not smart enough to figure out, I shouldn't be doing that or I shouldn't be doing this. Don't assume that they will make all the good decisions because you come from a nice family. Please don't fall into that trap. For Allah's sake, take those things away. There are other ways to entertain your children. So this is the first thing. When your children become teenagers, by the way, which happens a lot, right? Our children become teenagers. And as I travel the country, you know what happens with a lot of parents? They come to me and they say, I have a teenage girl. I have a teenage boy. I want you to talk to him. This has happened to me hundreds of times. Literally hundreds of times. And you know why they come to me? And I don't, I don't judge anyone. I don't judge anyone. Wallahi, I don't judge anyone. You know why they come? Because when they're teenagers, they become independent. And when they become independent, they no longer listen to you. When they no longer listen to you, you have to find somebody that they will listen to. The ship has already sailed. When was your chance? When was your chance? Before they turned into to semi-adults. That was your chance. Take, don't lose that opportunity. The thing that we have to learn here is, we're in a different world. The way you deal with your children back home is not the way you deal with them here. They're two different things. Back home you can yell at them, slap them, do whatever. It's all good. That's how everybody does it. Over here you yell at them a little, they'll go and talk, my, yeah, my dad, he's a total loser. They'll talk about, you, you like that. They will, among the friends, they will talk. I used to run a Sunday school, I was the, the head of a Sunday school, and my job, primary job, you know what it was? It was to be a spy. That was my prime. it wasn't curriculum, or am I teaching aqidah, or what textbooks to order, no, 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 no. That will come later. Let me go around during recess and spy on the conversations these kids are having. My mom let me buy an NC-17 video game, and I'm only eight. She loves me. No, she doesn't. <laughs> I have Grand Theft Auto, whatever, 85 now, right? This is, and did you see that movie? It's PG-13, but I still got to go see it. Or it's rated R and I've seen it. We even have the DVD at home. This is what the kids are talking about. You're messing your kids up. You think you love them? This is love? This is what Ibrahim would he approve of anything near this? Anything near, this is concern for children? Wake up! Really, wake up! We've, we've you know, uh, exposed our children to things in this society, it's, it's gone progressively worse, in media especially. So a movie that was PG-13 10 years ago is PG now. Okay, the, the standards have dropped. They, they're talking about it, it's not even me, they're talking about it. Right? So, uh, and you know, for example, homosexuality and these kinds of filthy things have now become norm even in cartoons. Even, it's not Tom and Jerry anymore. Things have changed. 
Things have changed. We have to be aware of what's going on. What our children are watching. The kinds of language they're using. The things they find normal. The, the things that have just become part of life. And you know when you come to the masjid and you see people with beards and making salah, and they're, you know, they're talking in a certain way, do, they, do your children see more of that or do they see the real world more? What the children see more is what they define as normal. So to your kids, in their head, this isn't normal. That's normal. And that's a problem. That's the real problem. They don't see this as normal. They see the outside world as normal. How do we change that for our children? How do we make this change happen for our children? This is really what I want to first be aware of this problem, and then let's talk about how to address this problem. What did I say the number one con catastrophe for our children is? They have no one to talk to. They have no one to talk to. When your child goes to public school and sees a boy and a girl together, or some, some girl comes up to your boy and says, you want to go to the prom, or we're getting together at this restaurant, you want to come with me, you're kind of cute. This happens to your fifth grader. This happens to your seventh grader. Your girl, your boy, it happens to them. Are they going to come home and talk to you about it? No. Hey, hey, hey dad, this girl told me I'm cute. What? Is this why we brought you to America? <laughs> slap, slap, you know, the works. This child knows my parents can't handle that information. So he's got to talk to someone about it. Guess who he's going to talk to? He's going to talk to his friends. And if he's going to public school, are his friends Muslim or non-Muslim? They're non-Muslim. So when he talks to his non-Muslim friends, what kind of advice is he going to get? Muslim advice or non-Muslim advice? Non-Muslim advice. Go for it, man. That's what he's going to get. And now your children are confiding in their friends and not in you because you're too strict. You don't talk to them. You don't open that door for them. Because you're used to having that authority that your father had on you, but that was back home. This is here, man. This is different. It doesn't work like that. We have to befriend our children. We have, we have to let them open up to us. And this is a problem even for me. I'm a father of three daughters. Right? And I'm, you know, I'm a protective father. So when my daughter was in, in preschool, in preschool, there was a boy that sat next to her, and she came home and said, Hamza sat next to me today. And we colored together. And I said, what? <laughs> you know? And my wife looked at me and said, just leave. <laughs> I'll talk to her. You leave. Because if I show anger now, then she'll know my dad doesn't like hearing about Hamza. So, next time Hamza does something or says something, is she going to tell me? No. So I've, I've actually chopped off my own foot when I said that. I have to learn how to deal with these things. It takes a little bit of tactics. It takes a little bit of patience to deal with our children. We put them here. It's not their fault. We put them here. We put them in that school. We put them in that environment. They didn't ask for it. We put them there. So if they're exposed to bad things, whose fault is it? Ours. So we have to take a little bit of responsibility and not just say, oh, how dare you say this? Or how dare you learn that word? Well, you put me in that school. You put me in that situation. You let me watch that movie. You didn't ask what friends I have and where they live and who their parents are and what, they, what we do when we get together. You didn't ask. That's your problem. So open up the doors of communication for your children. Open up those doors. Open them now before it's too late. Really, open them now before it's too late. Too many of our children have rebelled from their homes. Too many of our daughters have run away with boyfriends. Too many. Too many. And I know it's ugly to hear, but it's our reality. We have to face it. Too, too many of our sons have, have illicit relationships. You know, this is, this is a sick reality. We have to deal with this. And we can't just cry about it, we have to deal with it. So this is the first thing, open up the doors of communication with your children. The second thing, for your teenage children. I give you the example of Yaqub alayhi salam. We said he's a wonderful father. Did his, did his sons do real, something really messed up? They did. What did they do? You remember? They took his son, kidnapped him, dropped him in a ditch in the middle of the woods, and came back with a shirt with false blood on it. Did he know they were lying? Okay, so now here's a situation. There's some young sons. Here's a father. The father knows they did something horribly wrong horribly wrong, does he say, you scum, you better go back and get that, do you find any of that? What do you find? فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ When I hear that response, I say, what kind of dad is he? Why didn't he yell at them? Why didn't he, you know, you know why? Because he's an ingenious father. A father who really t takes care of parenting knows what is the age to advise your children and what is the age when they have become Independent. Well, no matter what I tell them, they're not going to listen. A father knows. So there's an age where the only thing you can do is what? 
sabrun jameel. There's an age that comes where all that's left is sabrun jameel. That's it. That's all you can do. Because now the ship is sailed. They're on their own. They're on their own. So your job is before they get to that point. Now if they've gotten to that point, if you have teenage kids, then the best you can do is try to introduce them to better company. To try to, you know, first of all, you know, uh, uh, give life to the youth groups at the masajid. I don't care what problems they have. Still, give them life. And uh, my advice to youth groups in general is keep the boys and girls separate. Have two separate youth groups. Don't combine them because you're asking for trouble. If you're a teenage boy or girl living in this society, then you have been exposed to enough shameless bombardment of media that those ideas are constantly running in your mind. And when you get a bunch of 15, 16, 17 year old Muslim boys and girls together and they're having an Isla Islamic program, please, please, let's be realistic. That's not a good idea. There are, there, there's no way a teenage boy can tell me nothing crossed my mind this whole event. There's no way. There's no way. You know how you were when you were 16 and 17. So don't, don't think your children are any different. So my advice to youth groups is, separate the boys and girls. And I don't care what youth group it is. Wallahi, I don't care if it's mass youth, or it's Crescent youth, or it's YM, or it's some other youth group you guys started, or it's an MSA, whatever it may be, support it. Help it out. Instead of telling me what problems they have, you have more problems. Don't tell me what problems they have. Tell me how can you make them better? How can you support them? How can you liven them? Because these are the refuge for your children. Your children, your teenage kids are not going to go listen to a shaykh. They're not. The vast majority of teenage, Muslim teenagers wouldn't even listen to me. Do you think they listen to me just because I don't have an accent? No. They're not going to listen to me. They see this, they run. They run. That's the reality. Who will they talk to? Other kids their age. Youth groups are the lifeline of Islamic da'wah to our youth. They're the lifeline. If we don't support them, we're losing it. We're gonna, it doesn't matter who the imam is. It doesn't matter how big the masjid gets. It doesn't matter what color carpet finally won in the board meeting. It does, none of that matters. None of that matters. What will, the only thing that will matter is, do we have a vehicle by which we're bringing the youth back in to Islam? Well, they're bringing it back into the masjid. Get over your, your fiqh debates. Whether it's 8 taraweeh or 20 taraweeh, your children don't care. That's a bigger problem. We can worry about those problems when times are good. These aren't good times. <laughs> so whether it is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Our children are more important. They're more important. Whether the guy is Hanafi or Shafi or Maliki or whatever you think he is, that's less important right now. Our children are more important right now. Let's prioritize. I was telling you in the, in the, in the khutbah of the churches in New York City that didn't think ahead. And what are they turned into now? They're nightclubs. Churches turned into nightclubs in the heart of New York City. One of the oldest Catholic communities in the country. And still, that's, that's what ended up happening with them. So on the other hand, you have the masajid. I, I met this brother. Wallahi, when I met him, I just I went in a corner and I cried. I just cried. This was a few years ago. I was at the Quran conference. And then this, there's this elderly fellow. He's about 80 some years old. He and his wife. Uh, you know, a white couple. Blonde. You know, blue eyes, really light skin. They're sitting next to each other at the Quran conference. And I'm sitting there and I, just, I was curious where they came from. So I went over and I said, you know, how are you? He said, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. So I was already surprised. Muslims, mashallah. So we, I started talking to them. And they said, yeah, well, what happened was, uh, you know, he, he told me his name. I, I forget his name, but it was some Russian or, 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 or some kind of uh, Slavic descent. But his great grandfather was actually a Muslim. And he, their family came to the United States some 150 years ago. And in two generations they lost Islam. Right? And then they were raised as just another Christian family. And, at, and he was doing research on his family tree. So he dug up such, some stuff in his attic and found out that his great grandfather was actually a scholar of Islam. And then he started looking into Islam and he found truth in it and took the Shahada reviving his great grandfather's tradition and his wife came to Islam too and then they, they live in Massachusetts somewhere so they decide they're gonna buy a Humvee and they're gonna travel the entire country stopping at every masjid they find <laughs> subhanallah and they, they were in Vegas at that point subhanallah but you know Allah guided these people Allah had written that for them but you know that alim that came who came to the US do you think he intended that his children would lose Islam one day and he didn't and he didn't think that was a problem maybe. Just like we think it's not, you're making a big deal out of nothing. If you could just see 50 years in advance, if you could just see,